Well, good morning, everyone. <laughs> I love this like super full room. It's it's so great to see you guys and to have you all here. Um, so, if you do not have a Bible, we have one for you underneath your seats, and you can grab that. And that's completely free. If you need a Bible at home, you are welcome to take that. If you don't know who I am, my name is Matt. I'm the pastor here at South Bay, and I just get the honor every week to be able to uh, open the Word for us and to just continue to teach and instruct as the Lord leads our church. And so, yeah, so that's what I'm here for. That's who I am. Uh, nobody too important, but uh, let's turn in our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. It's really important that you turn there. These scriptures will not be on the screen today. So Hebrews chapter 9. That's page 683 if you're using the church Bibles. I'll give you a moment to turn there. Just real quick, as an aside, I'm, I'm so glad um, to just hear report after report this week of, of how the Holy Spirit just ministered to you in a unique way through last week's message. And I, I just believe that the Lord's going to continue to lead us through this series and that He's going to continue to touch people's hearts and connect with people and just minister to people in very unique ways. And so as we continue through His Word and, and talk about the real Jesus and, and rediscover this very famous uh, God man in the history of things. And so um, thank you for joining us in person. Thank you for those of you online. I'm so glad you can tune in through technology this morning uh, to hear the word of God preached. Uh, I was reading an article from Christianity Today this week and came across some interesting information. Uh, according to a study done by Lifeway Research Group, Two out of three Americans confess to being a sinner. That's roughly 67%. The rest either don't see themselves as sinners or don't think sin exists. Now, while a few of the self-confessed sinners don't mind being one, most say they are working on being less of a sinner or depending on Jesus to overcome their sin. Sin, and in particular, humanity's sinful nature, is a very real thing. And here's how I know that. Even if the scriptures didn't tell me this, I have personally felt the pain of sin. Have you ever felt the pain of sin? Have you ever experienced heartbreak from an adulterous spouse or parent? Have you ever felt betrayed by a lying friend? Have you ever been deeply wounded by the affliction of gossip? Sometimes there are bruises given by the sins of others, and some days the pain we're feeling comes from our own sinful nature. It's our own tendency to hide behind a lie. Our own bent toward jealousy and envy. Our own inclination for quick, temporary satisfaction. And the deep hurt that we often cause for ourselves and for others can become often too much for us to stand. The reality of sin in our world grips us and we bear much grief. Hearts are broken. Relationships are torn apart. Souls are longing. Tears are shed. Joy is lost. Families are ruined. I probably don't have to tell you that you're a sinner. You know. <laughs> You've been there. You've seen it in your worst enemy and you've seen it in your best friend. You've seen it in your mom and you've seen it in your child. And Even right now, you realize that you are no different. And neither am I. No matter what I do, it seems that no good deed can make up for the bad that I've done. I'll go and I'll serve at the soup kitchen or perhaps give a few dollars to the guy on the street corner. Maybe I'll give a few toys to the Toys for Tots this year. And you think that'll make me feel better and perhaps it does for a moment. 
But not even these fine works of kindness are enough to cover up the scarring words that you said to your brother last week. And we become drenched in shame. And I mean drenched. A lot like those hash browns from Waffle House. We're smothered and covered and capped in shame. Much like Adam and Eve, we sin and we realize we're naked. And so we try to cover ourselves up and we try to hide. We try to distract ourselves, but no distraction can remove the shame that I feel. Netflix, Facebook, and YouTube don't keep enough content to clear a guilty conscience. For a moment, our thoughts are moved elsewhere, but the moment that we shut our laptop or put down our phone, there it is again. It's like it's right in front of us, those feelings of incredible angst. What if somebody finds out what I've done? What if I lose that friend or that job? I've already lost everything. I can't lose this too. Who can free us from the attraction of sin? Who can heal us of the wounds that we've been given and the ones that we've given away? Who can deliver us out of this bondage that sin has caused? A long time ago, the sins of the people were taken care of by priests. Now, the Old Testament priests were probably not like what you think of when you think of priests. There were different lines of priests in the Old Testament, but what we commonly describe when discussing Old Testament priests are the Levitical priests from the tribe of Levi, the family line of Aaron. Aaron was the brother of Moses that God ironically chose to serve as the father of the Levitical priesthood in Exodus 28. I say ironically because if you've read the stories of Aaron and Aaron's sons just a few short chapters later, then you would understand that Aaron was certainly not without many faults. The Levitical priests were primarily responsible for serving as mediators between God and man, representing man before God and offering up sacrifices for their sins according to the Mosaic law. You know that part you usually skip over in Leviticus? The Levites were given lots of roles in the caretaking of the tabernacle. Now, the priests held services there and acted as judges and teachers of the law. Once a year, on what was known as the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur now is how they reference it, the high priest, who was kind of like the priest above the priest, would enter into the Holy of Holies, or the most holy place where the presence of God resided, and he would sacrifice an unblemished lamb for the sins of God's people, Israel. This sacrifice was how the people were made righteous or they were put in right standing with God. And every year, after a long strand of evil and wicked deeds from God's people, the high priest would make a sacrifice on the Day of Atonement for Israel's sins. Year after year, sin after sin, sacrifice after sacrifice. And this was the system all the way up into the days of Jesus. All throughout the Old Testament, we read stories of the priesthood, but more than that, we read stories of the sins of humanity and the consequences of those sins. These sins caused a lot of grief for God's people and for God as well. And though sin certainly, without a shadow of a doubt, breaks God's heart and makes him sick and perhaps even brings about feelings of wrath, 
God deeply loves sinful human beings. I might even dare to say that God loves sinners. His heart was to be in perfect union once again with his people, sinful as they may be. But how could God be fully reconciled back to sinful people? There aren't enough lambs to take care of that. So God had a better plan. A once for all plan to reconcile the creation back to its creator. Jesus was that plan. Jesus is our great high priest. More than that, Jesus is our greater high priest. Jesus is who scripture refers to as the great high priest. He's the only one to receive this title. And that's because he is far above all other high priests. But Jesus is also our greater high priest because he serves as the high priest in a much greater way than the high priest of scripture in Jewish history. How so? In, in what ways does Jesus serve as our great and greater high priest? Three ways. First, he identified with sinners. He identified with sinners. Let's begin with one of our key scriptures from last week's message. I'm going to read from John chapter 1, verse 14. It'll be on the screen here. John 1, 14. And the word, we determined last week that the word that he's referring to is Jesus Christ. Uh, the word became flesh. And dwelt among us. He, he lived with us. And we have seen his glory. We have beheld him in his fullness. Glory as of the only son from the father. Full of grace and truth. Jesus who was the word of God. And at the same time was God. Submitted himself to the confines of human flesh. God in bone and muscle and skin. And he lived among us in community with humanity. Paul writes about this in Philippians chapter 2 verse 6 as well. This is what he says. Though he was God, talking about Jesus, though he was God, Jesus did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Jesus was in fact God but decided in his humanity to live in the limitations of those around him. Jesus did not stop being God. He did not lose his godness, but he willingly chose to identify with humanity by giving up his divine privileges. Now notice I said Jesus identified with sinners, not as a sinner. That's a difference. Jesus identified with humanity in many ways. You can see it in his compassion toward the sick, the lowly, the alienated, the poor, the needy. He met with them, talked to them, wept with them. He showed them that they were loved and seen. And oftentimes he could be found in that crowd. This is not at all what was expected of God's promised Messiah. They expected a warrior king, honestly, kind of like a governmental figure. But Jesus was a humble servant who showed up in crowds not filled with the rich and mighty, but with the weak and the lowly. Another way that Jesus identified with humanity was in temptation. This is from Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. The author of Hebrews says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Jesus, living as fully human, was to be tempted in every way that we are. This does not mean that Jesus was tempted in every specific way that we are, but that he was tempted in the physical, emotional, mental, relational, and spiritual sense. Yet, the passage says he was without sin. Now, both of these things were necessary for Jesus to remain as our high priest. 
knowing that he also faced temptation like we do, shows that we have a high priest we can relate to. He's not incomprehensible or detached from us. But knowing that Jesus was without sin shows that he remained untouched and unhindered by what John the Apostle called the desires of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. In other words, Jesus lived in perfect union with the Father. And though he was no sinner, Jesus saw firsthand in humanity and in his own human life the realities and depths of sin's curse in the world. Joan Osborne begged the question in her major hit single of 1995. No, this is serious. This is not funny. She said, what if God was one of us? Here's some encouraging good news for you today. He was. He was. And that's exactly what we needed in Jesus Christ. A great and greater high priest who could identify with sinners. Second, he died for sinners. He died for sinners. As stated earlier, the key role that the high priest played in the story of Israel was making an animal sacrifice every year on the Day of Atonement to cover up the sins of God's people. The Day of Atonement is a sad day for the Jewish people, even still, as they have not realized the good news that we have today. Jesus Christ died as the once-for-all sacrificial Lamb of God, the one who came to take away the sins of the world. And the author of the book of Hebrews makes such a, a huge deal of this, as they should. Jesus is the better priest, and Jesus is the better sacrifice. I want to encourage you today, this afternoon, like as soon as you get home, get out your Bible and read Hebrews chapter 4 through 10. That's a whole section, almost half, probably more than half of Hebrews, I guess, that speaks about Jesus as our great high priest. Um, so I'm serious about that. Do that. Um, I could preach a sermon all day on the cross of Jesus Christ, but the book of Hebrews is, in fact, a written down sermon. You may not know that. Uh, the, this preacher, the, the one that is being recorded here, it does it much better than I could. So we're going to listen to how Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11 through 28, describes Christ's superiority as the great and greater high priest as he reveals in his death. And so let's open up to Hebrews chapter 9. It's towards the back of the Bible. <coughs> Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, we're going to start in verse 11. This is what the author of Hebrews says. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places. Not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. For where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will takes effect only at death, since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. 
For when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. And in the same way, he sprinkled with the blood the blood, both the tent and all the vessels used in worship. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Thus, it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered, not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly, as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood, not his own. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is... He, Jesus, has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Jesus Christ has entered the holy places just as the high priest of the old covenant did. But it was not by animal sacrifice. It was by his own blood. The author says if animal sacrifices can purify, imagine what the blood of the Holy Son of God could do. Could it not at least free us from sin? So Christ is the mediator of the new covenant. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. He has shed his blood. We have been forgiven. Jesus Christ has entered into heaven and he appears before God on our behalf. More on that in a moment. But Jesus didn't have to shed his blood multiple times for each of your sins. But only once for all of your sins. Every year the high priest has to make a sacrifice, but Christ's sacrifice was sufficient for all people at all times. He, Jesus Christ, has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And so then, Christ's return will not be for dealing with sin, but to save all of those who have fastened themselves to him. Do you know what you have gained in the death of Christ? Do you know what happened at that cross? Do you know how the blood of the spotless Lamb of God, the Son of God in flesh, has covered you and your sin yesterday, today, and tomorrow? It's more than going to heaven when you die. It's union with God. It's purification for your sins. It's freedom from the power of sin. It's redemption in the blood of Jesus Christ. Brothers, sisters, friends, strangers, all those who have recognized Christ for who he is and have acknowledged his bloodshed for their sin will gain an eternal inheritance like you've never gained in your life. All is gain in the death of Christ for me. And then finally, he intercedes for sinners. He intercedes for sinners. So, <laughs> before we talk about how Christ is interceding for sinners, that is, redeemed sinners, it's important that we answer a question that you probably aren't asking right now. Who is Melchizedek? Everyone want to try to say that name with me? Who is Melchizedek? Just consider this a quick like theological rabbit trail that will be very helpful in how we continue in this conversation. But the Levitical priests were chosen 
from the tribe of Levi. Everyone pay attention because this is going to take a moment, I think. The Levitical priests were chosen from the tribe of Levi, from the family line of Aaron. Jesus was not from the tribe of Levi or the family line of Aaron. Jesus was from the tribe of Judah. And he was from the family line of David. This means that, according to God's declaration in Exodus 28, Jesus could not be declared as the great high priest. But we must consider this guy Melchizedek, the very first priest of God who served in a different manner. Melchizedek is a rather mysterious character in the story of scripture and though he is rarely talked about, Melchizedek is mentioned multiple times in the book of Hebrews. Melchizedek, whose name means king of righteousness and king of peace, meets with Abraham in Genesis chapter 14 after Abraham's defeat of a four king alliance and rescue of his nephew. Now Melchizedek says he is the priest of the Most High God. Melchizedek prays over Abraham and blesses him, and Abraham pays him a tithe for thanks. Now, what's all this matter? It is revealed to King David in a vision that he writes in Psalm 110 that the coming Lord, the coming Messiah, would forever be a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews echoes this point multiple times. Uh, this means that though Jesus Christ is not from the tribe of Levi or from the family line of Aaron, he remains as our great high priest because he comes after the order of Melchizedek. The superior blesses the inferior. We all get that, right? Like when you bless someone, it's assumed that you are the superior blessing the inferior. Melchizedek blessed Abraham. Levi came from Abraham and Jesus came from Melchizedek. This means that Melchizedek is greater than Abraham and Jesus is better than Levi or the Levitical priesthood. In other words, Jesus Christ was declared the eternal priest of Mel in Melchizedek long before the Levitical priesthood was established. So he was somewhat of a grandfather clause in, right? So it was working for him in, a, in kind of a grandfather clause way. Now, some have made good argument that Melchizedek very well could have been a pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? That before Jesus Christ actually took flesh in Matthew chapter 1, that Melchizedek may have been Jesus meeting with Abraham. It's the only time in all of scripture that Melchizedek takes a bodily form is in Genesis chapter 14. You might read um, Melch or Hebrews chapter 7 to understand why people might believe that Jesus was a pre-incarnate Melchizedek. So some have made a good argument that Melchizedek may have been a pre-incarnate Jesus Christ who would make way for his official entrance into the world and for his eventual ascension as the great high priest. Either way, here's what we can be sure of, that God made provision for Jesus Christ to be high priest in the end all the way back at the beginning of the story in Genesis chapter 14, long before Jesus Christ puts on flesh. So how then does Jesus serve as the eternal priest after the order of Melchizedek? Remember what Melchizedek did. He said, I am a priest of the Most High God. And what did he do? He prayed over and blessed Abraham. So how does Jesus do this after the order of Melchizedek? By blessing and praying over his people. Jesus is in heaven at the right hand of the Father, and he is praying and blessing and interceding for us. To intercede is to stand in the gap. That means that Jesus is moving and speaking and standing before God on our behalf. Isn't that a beautiful thought? But it's, it's not just a thought, it's reality. 
I, I love the words of Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 22 through 25. The author says, This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he, Jesus, holds his priesthood permanently because he continues and lives forever. Consequently, consequently meaning because of that, knowing that, therefore, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for us. And Jesus is not simply the savior of the world. He is the intercessor, the advocate, the praying, the blessing over all who have believed. And he doesn't partially save them, but he saves them, the scripture says, to the uttermost. This means he fully saves, he justifies, he sanctifies, he glorifies his people and nothing can separate them from his love and no one can pluck them from his hand. All of those who are saved in his death are kept in his life. And so he blesses and he keeps us. He prays over us. He stands before God for us. 1 Timothy 2 Verse 5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, that man, Jesus Christ. So in closing, the person and work of Jesus Christ, our great and greater high priest, remains as our high hope. This is good news for all of us who have received God's salvation. I urge you today, repent and believe the good news of Jesus Christ. To repent means to, to change your mind to, and then to, to turn around, right? To, to go the other direction. I was going Matt's way and when I repented, I changed my mind about the way I was living life and, and started to go God's way. And believe, and, and to believe is to place your trust, your faith, to, to, to take him at his word about his good news. The good news that you have been bought, bought by the blood of the Lamb. We are blessed in Christ, healed by his wounds, given peace in his sacrifice. He met us here and he keeps us there. Jesus Christ suffered in death presenting himself as the once for all sacrifice so that we might flourish in life. So finally, I'd just like to close uh, a little differently today. Instead of a, a loud and joyous ending today, I'd like to end on a more somber, reflective, but ultimately grateful note. And so here's what I'm going to do. You can, you can close your eyes. You can sit there quietly. You can sit there and look back at me. I don't care either way. But today, I, I want to finish with a, a chapter from Scripture in Isaiah. I just want you to think about the words that are being spoken, spoken over you. This is a messianic prophecy. That means it's before Jesus, but it's talking about Jesus. This is from Isaiah chapter 53. And I'm going to read this over you. And you can pray, be quiet. But I just want you to be still and, and listen to the words. Put away all your papers and, and, and all those things. Let's, let's just be calm before the Lord and receive his word together. I'll give you a moment to just get settled. All right, let's sit still and listen to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah says, who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? 
For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from with whom men hide their faces, he was despised and he esteemed him not. We esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and he has carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace and by his wounds we are healed. But all we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned, every one of us, to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent. So he opened up not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation who considered that he was cut out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people, and they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet, It was the will of God to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many, and he makes intercession for the transgressors. Let's pray. Surely you have borne our grief and you have carried our sorrow. In your punishment, we found peace. In your wounds, we found healing. But Lord Jesus, most of all, in your death, we have found life. Thank you, Lord. What is man that you should be mindful of him? You who made stars and galaxies and planets, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, what is man? Who am I that you should think of me? That Lord Jesus, you would come and become like me. God and bone, muscle and flesh. Lord, that you came and you died for me. In love for me, Lord, you came. And you paid a debt that I could never pay. And you died a death that I could never die. And you've given me a life that I could never find on my own.
And Lord Jesus, more than that, as our great high priest, not just our Savior, but our great high priest, you stand in the gap. You intercede for us. You bless us as your people. You keep us. You met us here and you keep us there. And you are able to save to the uttermost, to the fullest amount. Lord, in your prayers. Thank you, Lord, that you are faithful to us. Even when we have been unfaithful to you, even when we are inconsistent, Lord, you are consistent. You do not change. You are not swayed by the wind. But, Lord, you remain strong and steady. And, Lord, the same every day, yesterday, today, and forever. Lord, you are our great high priest, and you are the greater high priest, better than any who have come. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. And so if you have just placed your faith and trust in Jesus today for the first time, if you have repented of your sins and just turned towards the path of godliness, walking by his word, I just pray that you would just let us know on the back of your communication cards um, that you have done that, and that way we can send you resources for growing in your relationship with Jesus Christ. And so uh, let's have our ushers go ahead and receive our communication cards for those of us who have not uh, drop those in the offering baskets already because you weren't supposed to it looks like everybody did though right <laughs> well this was more of a reflective more somber more kind of you know, grateful sermon and so I pray that this encouraged you but let's stand as we have our benediction and then we will go our separate ways don't forget we have hospitality, uh, the fellowship tent opened up. We have coffee, it's heated tent. It's very nice and warm out there. There's tables to sit down at, some donuts, some, some coffee, some different things. Some bagels today, I'm being told, some bagels. Oh, we like bagels. Um, yeah, so, <laughs> hey, let's, uh, let's pray. Those of you watching online, if you just wanna put your hands out in a posture of receiving, um, those of us in the room receiving from the Lord. And let's pray. God, we thank you that you are with us and that you are for us, Lord. We thank you for how you just continue to just stir our affections for you every time we gather in this room, Lord. And so, Lord, I pray for every person under the sound of my voice, those of us in this room, those of us watching online from around the community and around the world, Lord, I pray that, God, you would bless us, that you would keep us, that you would shine your face on us, Lord, and that you would give us your peace. And so, Lord, now in the knowledge of your word and in the power of your spirit, send us out and bring us back together at the next appointed time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. You may go in peace.